Greetings, Mother Factors, and welcome to this street-level, surly, gritty, and adult edition of 101 Facts. I'm Sam, and today I'm here to talk to you about the hip, new, but actually really quite old kids on the Marvel superhero block, the Defenders. But how is Daredevil kind of responsible for the Avengers existing? Which one of the Defenders is responsible for a future Captain America? Oh, jeez, how did this happen? Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so call Alias Investigations, send a fax to the Heroes for Hire, and put Murdoch on Nelson on retainer, because this is 101 Facts About the Defenders. Number one. In case you thought this video was just about Sergio Ramos, Kyle Walker, David Luiz, and Leonardo Bonucci, who Football Daily told me are Defenders, <laughs> well, it ain't. The Defenders are a super group of Marvel heroes, much like the Avengers and the X-Men. Number two. The Defenders lineup is made up of the Hulk, Doctor Strange, and Namor the Submariner. Wait, what? Where's the blind one and the rich glow in the dark fist man? Also, wow, Hulk, Strange, and Namor? That's a pretty OP team. Number three. Anyway, these were the original Defenders, who appeared in the Defenders' first comic, which was released in 1971 in Marvel Features. Here they are, look, defending and such. Number four. The reason the initial Defenders was formed was to combat specifically mystical and supernatural threats, which kind of explains why Doctor Strange is knocking about. Number 5. Before the Defenders were formed, they had met before anyway. Because of the cancellation of Doctor Strange's series mid-arc, comic writer Roy Thomas merged his story with Hulks and Submariners to continue the narrative. Number 6. Between 1972 and 1986, the lineup was switched up and mashed up with new characters. New members included Luke Cage, more on that cool customer later, as well as Valkyrie, Nighthawk, and Gargoyle. Number 7. Fantastic Four's shiny BFF, the Silver Surfer, also became a prominent member too, adding to the general opiness of the team. Whoops, I just said penis. Number 8. Although Jessica Jones will appear as part of the supergroup in the Netflix series, Jones was not a member in the comics at all. The token female member role was instead fulfilled by Valkyrie. Number 9. Captain America, the Guardians of the Galaxy, and even Howard the Duck have all been a part of the Defenders at one point. Seriously, their membership changes as often as the Avengers, or Jennifer Lawrence changes her address and phone number, which is annoyingly often. Number 10. Doctor Strange has even formed the Secret Defenders after the originals disbanded. In the Secret Defenders, different heroes were hired for different missions, like a big superpower Swiss toolkit. Number 11. <laughs> But no, the reason you clicked on this video was probably because of the new Defenders that have their very own shiny TV show over on Netflix. This lineup is made up of just four members Daredevil, aka Matt Murdock, Jessica Jones, aka, um, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, aka Luke Cage, and Danny Rand, aka the Immortal Iron Fist. It's not really a secret identity, that one. He will readily tell you straight away if you ever meet him. Seriously, he never shuts up about it, in fact. Number 12. Danny Rand, aka the Iron Fist, is the only member of the group to have mystical powers, i.e. his glowing knuckle sandwich. The other three have all gained their powers by accident and experimentation. Number 13. These defenders face off against Sigourney Weaver, who is playing a character called Alexandra, Ooh. who is apparently not an existing Marvel character and was created as a villain specifically for the show. Number 14. Netflix set up a real website for the New York Daily Bulletin, a fictional newspaper in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The website had headlines that appear in the show, Easter eggs, and a link to Ward Meacham's LinkedIn page. Ward Meacham is a fictional character from Iron Fist, by the way, not just a random bloke who got lucky. Number 15. Comic creator Brian Michael Bendis and artist David Marquez were kind enough to release a new Defenders comic this year, featuring the same lineup as on the show. Number 16. Brian Michael Bendis noticed stuff when it comes to these guys, as he's previously worked on the Daredevil comic, and he invented Jessica Jones. Number 17. The difference between the show and the comic is, basically, the freedom the creators have within the story regardless of who has movies and who doesn't. For instance, in the 2017 comic, Doctor Strange, The Punisher, Blade, and Night Nurse have all made guest appearances. Number 18. Although they are part of the same cinematic universe, the Defenders are more low-level than the Avengers. As producer Jeff Loeb said, the Avengers are here to save the universe, and the Defenders are here to save the neighbourhood. Number 19. The neighbourhood they are saving specifically is New York itself. 
Their own individual shows focus on various areas in New York. Daredevil and Jessica Jones handle the bizarrely named real location of Hell's Kitchen. Luke Cage tackles Harlem, and Iron Fist, sworn protector of Kun Lun, mainly deals with Manhattan for some reason. Number 20. During the first teaser for The Defenders, set in an elevator, the time on the security camera says 8.18. This is a reference to the series' release date of the 18th of August, which is, oh my goodness, it's today. Number 21. The show will feature subtle colour coding for each character. Jones is purple, somewhat cruelly after her nemesis, the purple man. Cage is yellow after his traditional comic book colour. Daredevil is red to fit his outfit, hashtag on fleet. And green for Iron Fist to match his costume that he doesn't wear in the show. Number 22, uh... Hey, let's start a cage match for a second, talk about Luke. Luke Cage was created by Archie Goodwin, John Romita Sr and George Tusker. Number 23. His whole deal is that he has unbreakable skin. As a result of experimentation, he had performed on him in prison to examine cellular regeneration in the Super Soldier Serum. Yes, that's right, as in Captain America Super Soldier Serum. Number 24. Cage was created at the same time that a subgenre of movies called Black Exploitation was all the rage. Black Exploitation featured casts that were primarily black, as well as soundtracks of funk and soul music. Number 25. Cage first appeared in Luke Cage, Hero for Hire, number one in June 1972. He had the slightly bizarre honour of being the first black superhero to have his own comic book series. I say bizarre because I thought it would have happened before 1972, but hey, what can you do? Number 26. When black exploitation began to lose popularity, Cage was paired up with the Iron Fist in 1978. Cage gained the nickname Power Man, and the comic went under the name Power Man and the Iron Fist. The series then went on till 1986, when it was cancelled. Number 27. It was comic book writer Christopher Priest who gave him his seasonal catchphrase, Sweet Christmas. Sweet Christmas. I'm pretty sure he's the only one that can say that and make it sound. Number 28. Jessica Jones and Luke Cage get pretty close in the comics and in the show too. After a one night stand, the two work together as bodyguards for Matt Murdock. Soon after, Jones finds out she's pregnant, and they get married and live together happily ever after. Ah. Number 29. Jones gives birth to a baby girl, who they call Danielle after Danny Rand, the immortal Iron Fist and protector of Kun Lun. Thought I'd mention it just as often as he does to, you know, make Danny Rand happy. As you can imagine, as the daughter of two super people, Danielle has powers. The same powers as her parents, in fact. And in a parallel future on Earth 15061, Danielle becomes Captain America. Number 30. In the comics, Luke and Jessica struggle to find a babysitter for their super daughter, and so go through a lengthy interviewing process. Eventually, though, they settle on Squirrel Girl. Number 31. However, Carl Lucas, aka Luke Cage, also has another love interest in the Netflix shows, Claire Temple. Rosario Dawson portrays her in every single Netflix series, but Temple is her own character combined with the character of Linda Carter, aka the Night Nurse, who is basically a one-woman superheroic walk-in clinic. Number 32. Cage's story had planned to become a movie way before the Netflix show. Quentin Tarantino had expressed interest in the 90s with Lawrence Fishburne as the lead. However, he later dropped the idea for Pulp Fiction instead. Number 33. Columbia Pictures held the rights for a Luke Cage movie for quite some time, with John Singleton attached as director. The studio were also considering Jamie Foxx or Tyrese Gibson as Cage and Terrence Howard as the villain. This, as you may well remember, ended up never happening. Number 34. Jessica Jones' Netflix show is in fact the first live action appearance of Luke Cage. He already has his powers by the time we meet him, as evidenced by this sword for the gut. Don't try that at home, kids. Number 35. Mike Coulter is the man who plays Mr. Cage. He put on 30 pounds of muscle in order to play him, and boy does it show. Oh, what a hunk. Number 36. The grey hoodie Cage wears in his series, often covered in bullet holes, is a tribute to Trayvon Martin, the young African-American boy who was gunned down by Neighbourhood Watch coordinator George Zimmerman. Number 37. Biggie Smalls' wife, Faith Evans, performs at Villain Cottonmouth's club in the show. There is also a portrait of Biggie in his office. Number 38. Prince was also on the list to make a cameo and perform at the Harlem Paradise, but he unfortunately passed away before there was a chance to shoot. 
Number 39. Cage being an ex-police officer and ex-Navy was a creation for the Netflix series. Cage was neither of these things in the comics. Number 40. The beautifully surly Jessica Jones was created by Brian Michael Bendis and artist Michael Gados in 2001 for Max Comics and was the star of the series Alias. No, not the one with Jennifer Garner. Number 41. Originally, Jones' series was planned to be an ABC production, somehow. I mean, it really is too dark for ABC. A pilot script was written in 2010, which featured references to Tony Stark and Stark Industries, placing it firmly within the pre-existing Marvel Cinematic Universe. The meaning of life. However, ABC passed on the project in 2012, and a year later, Netflix came together with Marvel and Disney and made a deal to do four live-action series together and a mini-series. One of which, if you're attentive, you'll notice was Jessica Jones. Number 43. Brian Michael Bendis was also responsible for a character called Jessica Drew, who was Spider-Woman. Maybe he just loves the name Jessica. Number 44. In some of the comics, Jones went to the same high school as Peter Parker, and it's said she had a little bit of a crush on him. They built a bond as they were classmates, and they both lost family members in tragic circumstances. I can't imagine MCU Jessica Jones having a crush on MCU Spider-Man, can you? I mean, it seems like a sex crime at that point. Number 45. Spider-Man was a positive influence on Jessica Jones and inspired her to fight for good and become her superheroic alter ego, Jewel. Number 46. Jewel wasn't the only name she was known by either. After she married Luke Cage, she briefly changed her superhero name to Power Woman as a tribute to him. Oh. Number 47. Yes, in her early jewel days, she wore a skin-tight suit with bright pink hair, something that Jessica in the Netflix series feels is kind of ridiculous. She's played wonderfully by Kristen Ritter, by the way. Number 48. Jones briefly worked at the Daily Bugle as a vigilante analyst, which is a bizarre job title I didn't even know was real. She was on the trail of the true identity of Spidey, but actually found out that Norman Osborn was the Green Goblin along the way instead. Number 49. In the early stages of bringing Jessica Jones to TV, it was planned that Carol Danvers was going to be Jones' close friend. However, she was replaced by Trish Walker instead. Carol Danvers, by the way, is also known as Captain Marvel, and she's going to get her own Marvel Cinematic Universe film, played by Brie Larson, in 2019. Number 5th, the D. In the show, blonde Trish Walker is reminded of a form of red hair. This is a reference to her superhero persona, Hellcat, who had red hair. Number 51. Ritter put on 10 pounds of muscle and trained for two months before filming started. And you can see it, I mean, look at her, she's pumped. Number 52. The reason that she pumped up is because of Jessica's powers, which include super strength and flight. Although in the show, her flight is described as jumping really high, and we don't really see it all that often. In the comics, this is because her family car crashed into a vehicle containing radioactive waste. Damn, that stuff is either fatal or really useful, huh? Number 53. During the development process of the Luke Cage movie that never happened, Jessica Jones was set to appear and be African American. In fact, Megan Good was considered for the role. Number 54. The figure that eternally haunts Jessica Jones, Kilgrave, otherwise known as the Purple Man, actually started out as a villain of Daredevils and first appeared in Daredevil number 4 in 1964. Number 55. Eve. <coughs> Purple Man has the ability to literally command people to do whatever he pleases. He, of course, uses his power for evil. He's played deliciously evilly by David Tennant. Number 56. The Purple Man has a daughter in the comics named Kara Kilgrave. Like her father, she has purple skin and has strong mind control powers. But Kara uses her powers for good and is part of the superhero team Alpha Flight. Number 57. It's said that Kilgrave has had numerous children with women he's controlled over the years. He tries to gather them all together to make his own personal army, but this backfires quite dramatically. Number 58. Kilgrave was somehow once kidnapped by Doctor Doom in the comics and was forced to use his mind powers to help Doom enslave the whole world. Luckily, this backfired. Whew, close one. Number 59. David Tennant's Purple Man was inspired by Brian Michael Bendis' interpretation in the Alias comics, except he's not quite as literally purple. He wears a lot of purple. In fact, I like his suit. I kind of want it in a way. Number 60. The same comic is the loose inspiration for the Netflix series. 
Previously a superhero named Jewel, Jones is a private investigator who is a struggling alcoholic even before Kilgrave came in and controlled her life. Number 61. Kilgrave's mind control power comes from pheromones, and so some people can resist it, even though it's pretty difficult. Daredevil apparently can, out of sheer willpower, but robots and androids like Vision, who don't have a sense of smell, are also able to. Number 62. The Netflix show holds strong themes of consent, rape, and abusive relationships more than any other superhero TV property. In fact, Jessica Jones is praised very heavily for its portrayal of these issues. Number 63. Next up is the man without fear himself, the Stevie Wonder of crime fighting, Daredevil, aka Matt Murdock, avocado at law. Nintendo 64. Daredevil first appeared, unsurprisingly, in Daredevil number one, all the way back in 1964. Number 65. Matt Murdock was blinded as a young boy by toxic chemicals, yep, those things again, which then also gave him heightened awareness and super senses. He was then trained to a near-peak human condition, and in a little bit of a ninja styly, by another blind man named Stick. Number 66. When there was a struggle in the comic book industry in the 90s, DC and Marvel came together for crossovers. One of these crossovers was the Amalgam Universe, where mashups of characters existed in their own right. Daredevil and DC character Deathstroke were combined together, becoming Slade Murdoch, a blind mercenary who wears horns. Honey, honey, honey. Also, she's a lady. Forgot to mention. Number 67. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles creators Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird stated that Daredevil was a direct influence for the Turtles. Not sure how happy about that Murdoch would be in real life, if I'm honest, but good to know. Number 68. In fact, the Turtles' enemies, the Foot Clan, was inspired by the Hand, a clan of ninjas who tend to make Murdoch's life very difficult indeed. And also, Iron Fist apparently can't stop going on about them either. Number 69. Christmas. In the 1960s comic, Matt Murdock pretended that he had a twin brother called Mike in order to protect his secret identity. My god, Matt, you truly are a genius. Number 70! Remember the great 2003 Daredevil movie? No, me neither. But Ben Affleck actually auditioned to play Bullseye and Colin Farrell was considered for the leading role, but it ended up vice versa. Number 71. In the 60s, Daredevil had a predominantly yellow and red costume with a single D on the front. However, this was dropped by issue number 7. Maybe because, you know, it looks kind of stupid. I mean, it looks like it was designed by a blind guy. Oh. Number 72. Matt is not exactly very lucky in love in the comics, as many of them have met unfortunate ends. Karen Page contracted AIDS and was murdered. Gloriana O'Brien was murdered, and so was Electra. And Miller Donovan was driven insane by Mr. Fear. So stay away from Matt if he asks you out on a date. Okay. Number 73. That being said though, he did briefly date Black Widow in the 70s. Because of the Comic Code Authority not allowing unmarried people to live together in comics, Black Widow and the DD were shown sleeping in separate rooms. Oh. Number 74. Matt Murdock wasn't the first Daredevil in comic land though. Lev Gleason Publications released a comic featuring another Daredevil who is blind and deaf and somehow fought Nazis in World War II. Number 75. The Kingpin, aka Wilson Fisk, started out as Spider-Man's foe, but writer Frank Miller decided to make a more cartoony villain for Spidey instead and give Fisk to Daredevil. Number 76. Spidey and Daredevil have teamed up a number of times in the comics though, mostly to take down Kingpin a lot of the time. Hey, can we get a Marvel Netflix series of that Marvel and Sony, please? Please! <laughs> Number 77. Daredevil is sort of the reason for the Avengers' existence. Artist Bill Everett was fired by Marvel because he took over six months to pencil Daredevil for Man Without Fear, which left the company in a bit of a muddle. So Stan Lee stepped in and created the Avengers to rival the Justice League, and rushed out the series to take the place of Daredevil. So who knows, if Daredevil didn't exist, or rather did exist but wasn't late, the Avengers might not be a thing. Number 78. Ex-wife of the late great David Bowie, Angie Bowie, wanted to make a Black Widow and Daredevil TV series in 1975. She got the rights from Stan Lee and casted Ben Carruthers as Daredevil. However, it was never greenlit by a TV studio. Number 79. Filmmaker Kevin Smith wrote a story arc for Daredevil called Guardian Devil. Haha, <laughs> see what he did there? The comic ran from November 1998 to June 1999. Number 80. Daredevil wasn't as popular as he is today when he first came on the scene, and the series even faced cancellation. 
to try and save him, a collab with Iron Man was even in the works. But once legendary comic writer Frank Miller joined the team, he brought Daredevil back from the brink. Number 81. Frank Miller got the inspiration to give Daredevil a darker tone after he got mugged twice in New York City. Oh man, that's just unlucky. Number 82. Before he was busy hanging around with Michael Jackson, Yuri Geller teamed up with Daredevil in issue number 133 in 1976 to help him fight crime with his psychic abilities. Yep, that is a thing that actually did happen. Number 83. While Miller had a cameo in the 2003 movie version of Daredevil with Batfleck, he admits he's never watched the Netflix series but says he looks forward to watching it sometime. Maybe just in time for the Defenders, huh, Frank? <laughs> Number 84. Stan Lee's favourite comic book issue is Daredevil Number 7. In it, Daredevil fights Namor the Submariner in what seems like a frankly unfair fight. Daredevil predictably loses, by the way. Number 85. Even though Love is Blind and so is Matt Murdock, he has regained his sight on a couple of occasions. A hero called Moon Dragon cured his sight once, and so did the Beyonder, Iron Man and S.H.I.E.L.D. Number 86. Daredevil has only been betrayed in live action three times, by Charlie Cox, Ben Affleck in the movie, and by Rex Smith in The Trial of the Incredible Hulk, which was the very first time he appeared on screen. Number 87. In its time, Daredevil has lost two showrunners. Director Drew Goddard left the Sinister Six movie that, um, <clears throat> never quite materialised, and so did Stephen DeKnight, who left to write for the Transformers movie, which, <clears throat> should never have materialised. Number 88. The series was supposed to be a one-off, but because fans went crazy sauce, they decided to make more instead of having him only reappear in The Defenders. Number 89. Because of its dark and moody tone, the show's influences were the film Taxi Driver and Dog Day Afternoon. That's the film, by the way, not just a dog having a nice day in the afternoon. Number 90. Finally last, but uh, maybe least, The Immortal Iron Fist. Iron Fist was originally created by Roy Thomas and Jill Kane in 1974. Number 91. Danny Rand got his mystical powers after discovering the mystical land of Kun Lun and expressing the desire to get revenge for his dead parents. Yep, another superhero with dead parents. Say it ain't so. Number 92. He got the title of Iron Fist after he quite literally fought a dragon called Shao Lao the Undying and punching it right in its molten heart. Yep, that'll do it. Iron Fist is quite cool, really, isn't he? Punching a dragon. Take that, Khaleesi. Number 93. The Iron Fist has been part of many exclusive groups in his time. He's been a new Avenger, a secret Avenger, and, of course, a Defender. Number 94. He also filled in for Matt Murdock as Daredevil while he was in prison. However, this was without Murdock's permission, so he broke out to judge to confront him, and when he realised it was Danny, he asked him to continue so that he could track down Foggy's killer. Number 95. Even though Danny and Colleen Wing have a bit of a thing in the show, it's Rand and Misty Knight who are in a Randy romantic relationship after Rand hires Knight to help clear his name. Quick woo. Number 96. In fact, the couple were one of the first interracial kisses in comic book history in 1977. Although she was not in Iron Fist, Knight will be in The Defenders as she was in Luke Cage. Number 97. Luke Cage and Danny Rand used to team up as heroes for hire in their early days. However, the duo split up after Rand was assumed dead and Cage was blamed for the murder. Awkward. Number 98. Kane got the idea for the name Iron Fist from the very first Kung Fu movie he watched, in which there was a scene with the ceremony of the Iron Fist. Number 99. In 2000, Marvel began plans to make an Iron Fist film. Writers were hired in 2001, and Kirk Wong was signed to direct. No one had hired. However, Wong left in 2002, and so the film was pushed to late 2003. The film was then pushed to 2008, aka never, because Marvel instead wanted to focus on their cinematic universe plans. Something tells me they'll go well. <laughs> Number 101! <laughs> In 2013, Disney CEO Bob Iger said that even though Netflix characters probably won't get their own movies, if The Iron Fist is popular, he may get a feature-length film. Hmm, yeah. Unlikely that's going to happen anytime soon, I'm afraid. Sorry, Finn Jones, it's not your fault, mate. I blame Scott Buck. He 
ruined Dexter too. Oh, I love Dexter so much. Another way. Anyway, and more time. <laughs>